So since you guys are lucky enough to be right on time, you may hear us repeat a few things. But um, if you're not familiar with Real Stories, we are a filmmaking program for young women and non-binary youth. We are physically based in Oakland, but now because of COVID, we are everywhere. So we have some really cool upcoming programming that especially if you're interested in story, we have a three week story and screenwriting workshop starting next week with Christy Lowry. And Christy's a television director who writes for um, 911 Lone Star and several of other like amazing TV shows. And so that's gonna be really amazing coming up if you have youth filmmakers in your world. We have our advanced filmmaking cohort, which is a eight week session, which gives you an opportunity to continue to work on a project for eight weeks, either a solo project or partner up with some other members of the cohort. You should have some previous filmmaking experience. Um, then we have a whole bunch of other, we just started our after school program for filmmakers. So there's a lot of stuff coming up. So be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, all of those things. Um, and we will give it just a couple more minutes. Is anyone getting to breathe clean air where they are? <laughs> Use a little thumbs up symbol if you have clean air. We have a lot of ash we can bottle up for people. Yes, then. here in the Bay Area, it's ashy and terrible air quality. Um, also, Alexandra, Allie, we have a little survey, right? That we're gonna be, so if at some point, we are a very small organization, so we would love to find out how you found out about this program. So if you could just do us a favor, we will put a survey in the chat. I think it's three questions, two questions, one question, three questions, won't take you very long, but it'd be super helpful for us. Um, if you would fill that out, that would be hugely helpful. And should we give it one more minute? Are people still in the waiting room? Um, we have about, 14 people right now. So I would say that, uh, Nate, if you just want to get started, at least on your introduction aspect, while people are still trickling in and okay. in the storyboarding to reward the people that made it here on time. But um, I'm, I'm also with Real Stories, not a random person talking to you all. But, um, I'm going to be alongside Esther monitoring the chat for questions. I work as the program manager here at Real Stories. So I assist in kind of uh, logistically planning these programs. So we're really excited to see you. So we'll make sure to monitor the chat. And like I said, I'll be dropping the form in the chat a couple times towards the end to make sure you all have access to it. Thank yeah, you. and we'll be sure to, to leave the last 10, 15 minutes for questions. But um, if you're like me and you're afraid that your question, you'll forget your question, um, just feel free to put it in the chat. Or if you think it's pertinent, um, we're happy to make sure that it gets um, answered. So. Yeah, and I'll try my best to answer everything I can. Great. So Nate, do you want to take it away and introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. I, I, I can see my name. I'm Nathan Stanton. I've been in the animation industry for, boy, almost 30 years, uh, working on several movies, some television stuff, lots of commercials. I did a lot of 2D animation before I went to Pixar. So my first job was on The Nightmare Before Christmas. I think some of you might know that. And I did 2D animation on that. And I worked at a great place called Colossal Pictures and did more. 2D hand-run animation, and I thought for sure that's what I was going to end up doing for my career. I uh, ended up working on James and the Giant Peach. Uh, and then uh, Toy Story came out, and Pixar needed people for their second feature, and I really wanted to try my hand at some storyboarding. And so I applied there and ended up getting in in 1996, and I stayed for 22 years. And the last two years I've been doing freelance, um, which has been very interesting to kind of get back to that world, but I love making features. And that's really what this presentation is going to be, is about everything I learned at Pixar and now that I'm doing for other studios uh, in story, basically. So hopefully if you guys have questions or hopefully I will show you stuff that you hadn't thought about uh, pertaining to just story and storyboarding. Um, should I go ahead and start or do you guys want me to wait and let more people in or I can answer no, some questions, whatever you guys want to do. I think I would go for it, Nate, because I think a few people are going to actually get the recording after because they're coming in late for a meeting. Okay. I say jump right in because this is- All right, cool. Yeah. So I, we were having some keynote is issues, so hopefully everything will go smoothly uh, on my end. So I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to get to my presentation. Let's see. Is it going to open? Yes. Okay. All right. Woo! It's working. 
<laughs> okay, so as I said, I was at Pixar uh, from 1996 to 2018. And I was primarily storyboarding uh, on at least 14, if not 15 films. And I was head of story on uh, two different projects when I was there. So let's kind of just show you. These are many of the movies I worked on. I started on A Bug's Life and then ended up kind of going in chronological order. I worked on Toy Story 2, Monsters Incorporated, where I met my lovely wife, Esther. And I worked on Finding Nemo and Ratatouille, Wally. -E. I was the head of story on Cars 2. Uh, I also worked on Brave for a year, which was fantastic. I loved working with Brenda Chapman. She was great. Um, okay. Now it is not going. I'm gonna have to, uh, all right, this is, now I'm running into technical difficulties, I'm sorry. Maybe close out of that view and go back to the slide view. I am trying to get out. Let me stop sharing for a second. Yeah. Okay, there we go, okay, sorry. Let's get back to where I was. All right, now I need to share my screen again. I'm sorry, We're running into technical difficulties. We all have had technical difficulties. Yes, okay. Let's see, hopefully this will go back. Okay, so yes. So I got to work on one short when I was there, The Blue Umbrella. I'm pretty sure this was in front of Monsters University and I loved being the head of story on this because it was just me and the director and it was almost like working on one sequence for about nine, 10 months. It was great. I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, I had a chance to working on all of these. Finding Dory was really fun because I hadn't worked on the first movie for about 10 years. So it was kind of like meeting old friends again and getting to draw old characters. Uh, the Good Dinosaur I worked on for a short bit. Um, Coco I worked on for almost two and a half years. And uh, maybe a minute of what I did ended up in the movie. So just to show you, story can be kind of tough. If you want to do it, it's great but it doesn't mean everything he's gonna do is end up on the screen. Um, I did work on Incredibles 2, which was fantastic because I had not worked with Brad Bird and uh, I could see the lure. He was quite energetic and I just, I loved his energy and his creativity. I only worked on that for three months, but it was really, really fun. Uh, these are the last two big movies that I worked on. Um, Onward came out this year and I think Soul, it's seeming like it will probably end up on Disney Plus. So if you have that, you'll probably be able to see this which was really fun. I had not worked with Pete Docter, who was the director on this really only once on Monsters Incorporated, so many years before that. Uh, right now I'm working for Sunrise Productions, which is based in Cape Town, South Africa, as the head of story on their uh, next animated feature. They've made one called Jungle Beat that you can find out there, it's wonderful. And uh, I'm having a great time working with these guys playing that role, which I really wanted to do. The head of story is something that I really like. Okay, so I thought I'd talk about the process of like how, at least at Pixar, how we developed our features. So basically, um, oh man, I'm running into issues again. I'm sorry. I think it's because you're in Zoom instead of on your screen. Okay, meaning I need meaning to stop right <laughs> What's that? Oh, right oh it's working. okay. Yeah, sorry about this. Okay, so the idea is pitched three ideas are usually pitched and one is picked. And then you go into development and there is research concept work. That development phase can last anywhere from six months to a year. Sometimes, again, this is just Pixar specific. And then a writer is brought on or usually the person that is pitching it is the writer and the director wrapped into one, which is actually a great thing. There's just less hoops to jump through, less cooks in the kitchen. Uh, then there's a the script process. They have table reads. Sometimes they actually hire actors that come in and do this. And that script process in and of itself can last like for several, several months. Um, the script is broken down into sequences. And this is how we sort of hand everything out to a story crew. There's anywhere from six to 10 people. I have about six on my crew. And so everyone's working remotely. And so we're handing out all our sequences and then I, we check out everything people are doing. We send notes. And this is how it gets very kind of crazy. You have to keep track of all this stuff. And then you storyboard the entire movie multiple times. And that is an over a period of about three to four years. Again, that's only a Pixar. Not many other people can afford to spread that much time. It's usually maybe a year or two, depending on what studio you're working for. And then we call these the tent pole sequences. So after like three or four screenings, we call these the tent poles because they're sort of the giant tent poles that would hold up like a circus tent. What are the strongest sequences you have 
that haven't changed that you feel really good about, then you put those into production. And that's when things get really scary because you're feeding this beast that needs to be consistently fed. So you have to keep on getting these other sequences done and passing them on. Um, so I thought I'd kind of go down to like just what storyboarding is like. This is a wonderful uh, thing you might've seen. Uh, the amazing Joe Ramft who passed away many years ago. He was a teacher of mine at college and I worked with him at Pixar for many years. He sort of storyboarded the storyboarding process. And I think this is a great way to sort of look at like how we do what we do if you're working on a feature. Okay, so I keep on getting this, sorry. So you're saying stop, okay. Yeah, sorry. All right, it's gonna keep on doing this. So this is the story man or story woman working away feverishly. We used to do everything on paper and you have your calendar, you gotta keep track of all your weeks. And we used to pin up all the boards and you had little dialogue strips. And so you're, hmm, how do I make this sequence the best it can be? And I love this board because this tells you everything you're doing about storyboarding. You're thinking about the acting, you're thinking about the writing, the script pages you're getting, you're thinking about the editing or the cutting. And the two things that I love about storyboarding, the composition and the staging, what is the images that you're creating and are they visually enhancing the storytelling? And then you're feverish, you're running around, you're throwing things away, you're boarding and boarding. And then you're like, ah, yes, it's ready. It's ready to be pitched. And this is terrifying. This is what we used to have to do. We have to get up in front of a group of people and really act it out. And now everything is sort of digital and that's fine, but this was really fun. You can actually could hone your skills at a sort of acting and also getting a presentation to a bunch of people. And then here's John, yes, with all the people around and he's thinking. And then often it's like, yes, you get an idea from whatever you're pitching. And then this is where it gets really crazy. Ideally, it's very creative. It's kind of scary, people are arguing, but then this is gonna be great. And so ideally you're building upon what you've pitched and the ideas are getting better. And then this is often what it feels like after a pitch. Oh, you're kind of exhausted. All those yellow bits are a little post-it. We used to put post-its on all the boards for all of our notes. And just like that, we would be ripping things off the board and they end up on the floor. Uh, and then you get up like, what just happened? Uh, and your job is to keep track of all of these notes and then hmm, you go back to the drawing board and you do your second pass of a sequence. Ah, yes, you get back to the work. And so that would be a first pass. Then you have a second pass. Ideally, you have less notes. And then a third pass would be, okay, let's send this off to editorial. And so you have a whole team of people doing this. And obviously, you know, it's, it's quite crazy and you have to keep track of everything. That process would last for maybe six months, maybe three months, somewhere in between. And you put the whole movie up. And then you tear it back down or keep on boarding and reboarding. And so it's a very iterative, long and arduous process, but it can be quite fun. Um, okay, I keep on getting this, sorry. Hang in there. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Okay, sorry. Let's get back to sharing, sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay, I took a picture of this when I was working on Finding Dory and uh, we were kind of doing things on paper because I was in a satellite office. I didn't have a main office. We were in a different building and the director I was working with loved working on paper. So this is what it used to be like. We had big boards like this. Your whole sequence would maybe be on like five to seven of boards, lots of post-its. And as you can see, things were moved around. And I love this because people were, other people were drawing, if you had an idea, they could just slap it on the board. And uh, I, I love working this way because it's out for everyone to be able to see. And you can, again, it's a very fun way to work your pitching stuff again. Okay. I think I'm gonna have to, sorry, stop sharing. I think I'm just gonna have to do it like this. So, sorry. Okay. We're gonna have to do it like this. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> Not perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can get a little bigger. Maybe that would help. Uh, yeah, we can't quite see the whole screen. Okay, this is better than nothing. All right, so again, it all comes down to this. These are the things that I think are really important if you're gonna get into storyboarding. You have to think about it. You have to think about the acting, the writing, whatever pages you're getting. Sometimes you don't get pages. Sometimes you just get beats for something that you're doing. Uh, and the editing, the cutting, that's something that it took me a long time to really understand. I had watched movies my entire life, but I never really knew about that, that art of cutting image to image to image. It's, it takes a while to kind of learn that. 
And then the composition and the staging, it's like, how do you make an interesting image that is, again, supporting the story? Um, I cannot recommend thumbnailing enough. And that means just drawing a little small things. This is just a little page that I had done for myself with another project that I was doing. Um, why I like this is because you work rough. You're not getting lost trying to create some beautiful image when you don't even know what the sequence is or what the movie is. You're still trying to find it. Um, you can test out your ideas. I love that because you should be testing out. You should be trying different things and trying different compositions, different staging ideas. Um, and then it comes down to shot flow. Are your images flowing like they should be? And by that, I mean, can you cut from a wide to a close up to a two shot? Like you're gonna learn all this as you're doing it. I'm sure many of you are. Uh, and then you're focusing on your camera work. And by that, I mean, staging, composition, editing, all those things you're thinking of like, what is the right, where should my camera be when I'm telling the story? What does the director want? Sometimes I'll give you notes. Uh, I also like, someone had mentioned this when I worked at Pixar, drawing your way to a solution. And again, when you're thumbnailing and doing little drawings, you're gonna do a lot of them. And if you can't figure out a way to start a sequence that you're on, you can often just find it as you're doing your thumbnails and realize, oh, wait a minute, this is how I should start my sequence. And you haven't wasted hours or days or even weeks doing like much larger images. Um, and then this is the last but not least, really important, uh, I procrastinate a lot still after many years. And so I found, oh, if I do a sequence like this in thumbnails, I can get a whole pass done much quicker. And then I would go to the Xerox machine and I would blow it up and then I'd pin everything up and it would look like I had done a lot more. Um, but most importantly is showing up to the director with a whole pass in the sequence. You don't want to show up with just half a pass and that, that doesn't fly and it, it's not really good. You want to have thought up the whole thing from start to finish. Even if it's rough, it's really important that you're showing the whole thing. So again, thumbnails really help with that. Um, I'm going to show you guys Okay, yes, even like this. Okay, uh, I'm gonna show you guys, these are some thumbnails that I had done for Finding Nemo. And again, just playing with staging, just playing with composition, trying to think of like what the bottom of the ocean floor would look like. Uh, again, what it looks like with Father and Nemo together. What do they look like on the screen together? We tried to always make him small in the frame. Again, these are teeny tiny little drawings, but these are often things I would show the director just to get a sense of what do you think about this? What do you think about that? How do they look on the frame together? Um, again, just literally just staging and composition. This is just what it, you do a lot of. If you have the time to do it, it's great. Uh, these are actually thumbnails from the director himself. And I love this because often you can sit down at a table and they'll do a bunch of drawings for you for like a sequence that you're working on. You'll do it together. Uh, but this is almost like a little guide. So if you have a director that knows how to draw, that is really great. It's very helpful. Um, one of my favorite directors, Ridley Scott, he went to art school and he does his own boards. He'll do lots of these little thumbnails and then he has other people that are doing the boarding, but he'll do pages of this and give it to them to work from. I love that. So again, this is sort of like a guide. It's like a blueprint for the sequence that I was working on. So I saved these because I think they're great. They're really, and these are teeny tiny little drawings. Very good. Uh, for Wally, I got a chance to work on Wally for about two to three months and there were just three of us. We just storyboarded the first act of the movie and that was what we showed the executives basically is like, this is what we want to do. Can we keep on boarding? Can we keep storyboarding the rest of the movie? And so these are some thumbnails. This is the template that I have. These are not too hard to find or make. Uh, why I like these, let me use my cursor, is that I can do lots of little notes all around. And so as you see with the red, any notes I got from the director, I did them with a red pen, so I wouldn't forget what they were. Also th things like this, I'm sort of drawing what I wanted the camera to do. I wanted the camera to be zooming down this row of trash and then basically uh, rotate right. And so that's kind of what I was thinking when I was pitching this. So again, these are not pretty immaculate drawings. It's just basically telling the director where I think the camera should be and the beats of the scene. And then as you see, lots of notes here that, and then the director himself did some scribbles. And so like I would have pages and pages and pages of this, uh, but I liked it. I like to be able to pin these things up or this is how I organized what I wanted to do. And you don't have to do it this way. You can do it in writing, but obviously visual is really important. As you can see, he looked a little different. He had these little telescope eyes. But again, I made sure to take all my notes in red pen so I wouldn't get confused about what I needed to do. Uh, so yeah, again, these templates are great. I find them to be, I just print a bunch out, do my drawings. Right now when I'm working remotely with my team that's all over the place, I will do notes like this for their sequence, scan it in and then send it to them in an email when they like it. They get like a visual little representation of what they need to do. Uh, for Coco, I did a lot of, 
Again, Maybe. just studies. Yes. I have a oh. question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, um, before. Oh, sorry. Go, Esther. Yeah. <laughs> So. Okay. so no, just before you moved on, I see you were about to move on to your next portion. So yeah. there's a really good question that says, when you're doing these pitches on paper and you have shots with repeat backgrounds, do you Xerox them? Oh, all on paper? Uh, yeah, we used to actually, way, way back when, I used to do one background and that would Xerox it like 20 times. And then I would cut it out with, a, with scissors. It was like so archaic, but it still saved a lot of time um because i wouldn't have to redraw the background now that everything is sort of on photoshop it's, that's the beauty of working digitally is that you don't have to worry about that so yes back then i would xerox one background and then cut it out on paper it was just crazy or we have we would have like those like large paper cutters and then we would do a lot of that yeah which is it sounds so archaic but um back then it was the easiest way to do it it was fine yeah does that answer the question hopefully Yes. You know, okay. If you had a follow up, just let us know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so I was going to show Coco. I had a lot of, we had a lot of time trying to figure out this movie. We, I actually storyboarded two different versions of this movie before the third one that actually got out to uh, the audiences worldwide. So in this version, the mother was dying and she was in a hospital. And so these were just studies of like, well, what would it look like if the son was trying to visit his mother that was dying in the hospital? So again, these are just studies. I kind of like this angle sort of in the back of the room. This is again, what if it's behind the boy as he walks in, as he sees his mother. Um, I kind of like breaking this, the screen with the, the sort of the ivy bag and the, like, the, the pole that it was on. Like that's, you know, what are interesting ways to make a, a, an image? Um, this is sort of over the shoulder looking at his mother. So again, this is a much different version of the movie when the mother was dying in the hospital and the son was visiting. Um, again, just compositions of like, what an unhappy teenager looked like in his room as his dad comes into the doorway. Just, again, trying to come up with interesting images. Um, the alabrijes in this movie were much larger. We kind of thought they would be like these almost dinosaurs. And so again, just thinking of any interesting images, we did a lot of this, lots of sketches and everyone on the team did this. And then you'd fill a room with images. And this is what you would show the director. It was great. I love working this way. Uh, this was an idea about when he met his family, what they might look like. And uh, obviously, the very beginning, we didn't quite have the skeletons designed. And uh, I just basically was drawing like them with clothes. And, you know, again, this is a cool way to get your ideas down and what you would show the director. So this is some of the stuff we did uh, back then. Um, so I thought I'd pull out even wider and talk about just story structure. This is what we do when we're working on these features. This is what I'm doing right now on the feature that I'm in. We've had one screening, and now we're just basically looking at the entire movie and talking about structure. So like this is basically the terminology that we would use and that you might use if you're working on a feature. And it, a lot of this is just the three act structure. It's an act one, act two, act three. Um, by that we mean a beginning, middle and an end. This isn't, you don't have to do this, but this is very helpful in trying to figure out what is wrong with your movie and what needs to be fixed. Um, so we would break it down like this. And I'm gonna use Back to the Future. I'm assuming you guys have seen Back to the Future. Have most of you seen Back to the Future? Are we getting, uh, hopefully, yeah. no? Thumbs up sign if you- Okay, can. yeah. That, okay, because that movie is a great example of this kind of structure. Okay, so I'm gonna step it through. So we have act one, act two, and three. This is what we would, the terminology we would use. Okay, so we're gonna introduce the characters and the rules of the world. And in Back to the Future, that would be basically the opening movie with the clocks and you get all this information about the plutonium being stolen and then you meet Marty, right? He comes in and he plays the guitar. There's the giant amp there. So like, that's how that works in that movie. And then we have the inciting incident. And that is like, what is propelling the story forward? What is upsetting the life of your main character? So for Back to the Future, that would be him going out, seeing the doc with his time machine. But really is what, what specifically what it is, is the terrorist showing up and then there's gunfire and he has to jump in the car to escape. That is what propels the story forward because he ends up going lived into the past. So now the act one break, the plot goal, ideally, you know what the plot goal is. And for Back to the Future, once he gets to the past, it's pretty obvious. How is he going to get home? So like, that's the whole goal of the rest of the movie. How am I going to get home? And then the midpoint is what we would say is the plot stakes rise. Is there a shift in the dynamic of the story? This isn't, doesn't have to be, but you'd be surprised to pick a movie that you like and go right to the middle of the movie. And by that, I mean, like, is your movie two hours? Go to the hour mark. Is it 90 minutes? Go to the 45 minute mark. And you'd be surprised, something happens that often shifts the story. And for Back to the Future, in this movie, it's specifically when Doc looks at the photograph and realizes, oh my gosh, your brothers are being erased from history. 
and you realize if I don't get my parents together, I'm going to cease to exist. So what is that doing? That's, that's escalating the stakes of the story. It gets even worse. Not only do I have to get home, how am I going to get home, but how am I going to exist unless I get my parents together? That's a great example of like a good midpoint action. And then end of act two, uh, you bring your protagonist and they're to the lowest point. And for, again, for Back to the Future, that would be when he's on stage and he's playing the music and then he starts to falter and his hand, you can see through his hand, he almost disappears. That would be his lowest point. But in that movie, Back to the Future, it's a very short act three. Then it becomes about like, okay, how am I going to get home? And then you have all the clock tower stuff and all these things that happen. Uh, and then you have the climax, which is a boom. So again, this is him getting back home and traveling back to the future. Uh, that's, so that's the culmination of plot and character goals. And then again, for Back to the Future, the epilogue, uh, there's a new balance. Is there a new balance to the world? And in Back to the Future, a great example. Everything is different, right? His parents are prosperous. His brother and sister are not sad sex. Like, it's a whole different world that he has created for himself. Um, so why I put this out is because if you're going to be in a story team and you're going to be working at a big studio, I guarantee you, you're going to be talking about things like this when you're putting the movie together and you're storyboarding with Hope Film and you're taking it apart. And this is the thing that I didn't know when you got into that world is that you're in a room with a bunch of people talking for like a week, not two. And that, that's, a, that's really tricky to sort of learn how to speak up and know when to add an idea that you think is going to be better. Um, so it took me a long time to learn this stuff. So it's not, don't be intimidated. It just does take some time, but you can do some studying. But again, look at your favorite movie and like pick these points and you'd be surprised. Like it really does fit, it does work. Um, I often liken to making our movies like building a pyramid, right? So like every screening we do is a layer of the pyramid and we're trying to get closer and closer to the top. And the tippy top is basically the movie that's finished that gets released to the world. Um, I like this image because we have the producer and the director lording over the story surfs as they struggle to storyboard the movie. And I like these layers basically are like every screening. And so every time I worked on a movie, you always hit the doldrums. You had a couple of bad screenings and everyone would be sad and you'd have bad morale. So you just try to tell your team like we're, we're right in the middle of the pyramid. We've, we've laid all this foundation and we're getting there, but it's just we have a few, few more screenings to make the movie better. So I found this is a helpful way to look at it. Another one is the uh, archeological dig. Um, you're digging and you're digging, you're trying to find your story, right? Like what is your story? You know it's a dinosaur, uh, but what kind of dinosaur? So you're digging and digging and then you find, aha, it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yes, I think we know what this movie is. It's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, great. So then you have your screening and it doesn't do so well. And you keep on digging and digging and digging and you realize, okay, wait a minute. The movie is a stegosaurus. Okay, we thought it was a tyrannosaurus. We were a little off. It's a stegosaurus. You keep on digging. Oh, wait a minute. It's a brontosaurus. Okay, we, did, we, were, we were a little off. We're getting closer. Wait, we're digging. Okay, wait a minute. It's a pterodactyl. Okay, I think, I think it's, it feels like we're getting there. And then, oh, okay, wait a minute. It's a velociraptor. Okay, that's, we now know that's what this movie is. And why I like this image is because all the other versions of the movie you did, the Tyrannosaurus, the Stegosaurus, the, all the other versions, they're still part of the movie that you're telling because there's no way you could have gotten to this without doing all these other versions. It's really important. And it's, again, it's a very slow, methodical, very iterative and frustrating process, but it is worth it because, you know, I would think that most of the Pixar films are quite good. It takes us a while to get there. Um, you have to get through all the bad versions, as we would say, to get to the good stuff. Yeah, we have a question. We yes. On. Um, how do you know when to stop? Do you mean like, how do you know when that the film is good enough? Sorry, Chris, Christian, or is that Riley? Who asked that question? Yeah, please use the microphone. Yes. What I meant by that question was you're talking with your dinosaur analogy. Yes. How do you know which dinosaur is the final one you want to set on? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, ideally, you know, by screening four or five, A, you know what the movie is and it's getting good and it's, it's getting right. It's getting entertaining, even though it's still kind of broken. Uh, a lot of that is just, there's a release date. <laughs> there is a release date and you cannot, you know, I've been at Pixar with, they moved release dates, but only little, like you have to deliver a movie. And I've often been told, they don't quite finish it. It's almost like they pry it out of the hands of the filmmakers because it has to be finished. Um, but that's a very good question. It's tricky because I've worked on movies where 
I thought this version, I thought the Brontosaurus version was better, right? And I thought that would have been a cool movie. But again, it, it all comes down to having a strong director who has leadership skills and a studio that backs them, right? You don't want to have a studio and a, and a director fighting each other. I have experienced that and it is not pleasant. And what happens is the director gets replaced. And then that, then you're sort of in a world of hurt. It's not pleasant. So it's about compromise? Could say. Well, yes, there's plenty of compromise. But again, if you have a strong director who has a strong vision, they're going to fight for that vision, right? But they're going to they're gonna know where compromise is. You're going to get notes. Whenever you show your reels to anybody, you're going to get notes. And so it's a tricky little dance, as I like to call it, where you're going to get these notes. And then the, the question is, which notes do you address? Like you can't address them all because you're going to end up with a big muddy mess. And I have experienced that as well. But if you have a strong director that knows what they want and knows how to sift through the notes and, and really could drill down deep to find what, if you have enough people, like 75% of the people that fill out a survey that say your main character is super boring, then there's something wrong. You have to address that note. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, it's, it's believe me, it's it's a crazy ride that you go on. Um, <laughs> I see my wife like, yes, it's crazy. But ideally, by the end, you do have a good version of a movie that you feel strongly about. Um, for me, it's tricky. Like I, on Coco, the very first version, I love that version. And I thought we could have told that one and done well with it. But the version that's in the theaters is wonderful. So it's, you just, you have to have a lot of faith and a lot of trust in the system and the studio you're working for and the director you're working for. It takes a lot of leadership to steer that ship. And uh, it's almost like a general in an army because by the time the movie gets to be in production, there's almost 200 people that, that they're sort of managing. It's a lot. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then it, it, it did. Thank you. Okay. And then yes. there's one other before you yes. move on. What's, of what's um, a Pixar film? Um, sorry, the chat went away. What's a Pixar example that had a lot of changes to the end of the story? All I'd say all of them. <laughs> say every single one. There's not one movie I worked on where... It was, I mean, the only one that comes close to that is Wally, uh, because the director took his development time and he was like, I know what I want to do. I'm going to take three storyboard people. I was lucky to be one of them. And we're going to storyboard the, just the first act. That's basically meeting Wally all the way to the point where he grabs onto the rocket ship as it takes off. Uh, that first act really didn't change that much, uh, but we storyboarded that whole movie. And it wasn't people they found in space, it was aliens. It's an entirely different movie. And I love that version. We called that the Spartacus version of Wally because Wally incited a robot rebellion and it got really crazy and kooky and strange. Uh, and then after that screening, someone said, hey, what if it's people? What if it's all the people that left Earth? That he, and we were like, why didn't we think of that in the first place? And so that's what the movie became. Um, but every movie, um, Nemo, I think we, you know, we storyboarded that movie and we had a good skeletal structure that still changed a lot, but I, I mean, I guess to make a long story short, like they all change. Not one of the movies when you first board it is going to be what is going to be the end. But again, that's that's just the Pixar process. Like you talk to someone at like Sony or DreamWorks or Blue Sky, you may get a very different answer. We just they're just willing at Pixar to sort of like veer and, and try different things. And Pete Doctor for is an example of someone. It takes him forever to find his movie, uh, but he makes amazing movies. But as a story guy, that can be an incredibly frustrating experience, um, but quite rewarding if you make it to the end. <laughs> hey, Nate, just one more question. Yes. I have a question about deadlines and any tips that you could give creators on keeping up with them, like release yeah. dates and such. Yeah, well, that's kind of why I brought up thumbnails. If it's storyboarding, like I love thumbnailing because you can hit those deadlines because I would procrastinate and I still do. I, I have, it's like an art form for me, um, but like, Thumbnailing, I realized, oh, okay, I can get a lot of work done in a day when I had four days to do it. Um, but again, you can't ignore them because uh, if you do that, you're not going to last long at a job. It's just, it's like just keeping up. It's just like homework. You got to do a little bit every day and keep up and, and make your goals, know what you're doing because time goes by much quicker than you think it does. It's trickier, I think, for animation and other other things that you would be doing. Art department's a little more amoeba-like in terms of what you're being asked to do. Uh, on a feature, you know, that it, at Pixar, it takes like four or five years to do. Those last two years are like a nightmare because all the people that are lighting the movie, they've, they were at first were like, we have six months to light our movie. And then that turns into like two months. 
those are the people that really suffer and they're working six day weeks and long hours. So, you know, that's something to think about, like <laughs> depending on what you want to do <laughs> in production earlier, you have more time, but later it's, uh, and we have a lot of them say the animators are the rock stars, those guys, everything they do is on the screen, but they have very tight deadlines. Uh, it's hard. It's a struggle. Some days you're, you're not on your game and you're not doing enough. Um, I have no idea if that answers your question, but um, I know for story, I think thumbnailing is something that really helped me with that. Is that, did that help whoever answered, uh, asked that question? <laughs> I hope it did. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, after this, basically it, it, as simple as this sounds, th this is basically what working on a movie, you're constantly, the pendulum is swinging between plot and character. That's really what you're struggling with. So you're gonna get all these notes about plot, all these notes about character. And uh, th that's, again, it's like this delicate dance of like, which notes do we address? How do we tackle equal amounts of both? Uh, every screening I did, sometimes the movie would be too plot heavy and not enough character. Some screenings, there'd be too much character and the plot was confusing or not enough of it. So it, that's really what it comes down to is these things. So I kind of, I put these three movies up uh, because I think these characters, there's traits of these characters that I really like that are clear. So with Woody, um, and I'm gonna look to you guys to hopefully help moderate. What would be, what's, what's the problem with Woody when Buzz shows up? How, how does he feel? You guys are welcome to just unmute and yes. put it out or put it in the chat. If you don't Jealous. Feels betrayed. Yes. Jealous. Yeah. That is correct. So jealousy is what gets Woody in trouble, right? And why I like this is because every, every person in the, on this call on the planet has gotten jealous at some point in their life. So again, trying to find traits that, you, that are believable that the audience can understand. So you get it. He's jealous, right? And then he ends up knocking Woody out the, uh, I'm sorry, Buzz out the window. And then, you know, the, and then the story is propelled from there. Uh, what would, sorry, what would Marlon be? What would Marlon's issue be as a father? Scared. Overprotective. Yes, he's constantly fearful, right? So he's overprotective of his son. He's full of fear. And what happens? His son is so angry. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go touch that boat because I'm so angry that my dad doesn't let me do anything. And then he gets taken. And then boom, there's your story. It's like, oh my God, because of my fear, I was overprotective. And then my son did something really stupid because he was so frustrated. Uh, with Merida, what would be Merida's issue be? Well, she wanted to change her fate because she thought that her um, mother was too controlling and she okay, wanted to take yep. her But her how, could you boil it down to one thing? Like what, what, what would her nature, what was the one thing that she is? What, what is a teenager often like? Freedom. Freedom, but what, what, is, but what, what traits? In the chat, you stubborn. got stubborn, rebellious. Yeah, okay. Stubborn and rebellious and rebellious is what I was looking for. Like what's one trait because she's so rebellious, right? And everything, uh, Miranda, you said is correct. She gets so frustrated, she's so rebellious. She's like, you know, I'm, if I could just get my mom to be a certain way, everything would be better. And then, of course, right, she gets the wrong uh, spell. Her mom turns into a bear. And then, like, boom, there's your issue. There's your problem. Why I put all these out is because they're very specific traits that we would work really hard at infusing these characters with. And it just doesn't come out of nowhere. Right? It's, it's many screenings of the, Fumi, the movie trying to hone what these characters are doing. And why I like this is because the choices these characters make motivate the plot and that is a far more interesting thing in storytelling so woody's jealousy causes trouble he hits buzz out the window that's causes the story to propel forward marlin because of his fear he's overprotective his son gets so angry that he goes out to the boat he gets taken merida she's so rebellious that she does something stupid and gets this cake with a spell in it and said everything's going to be great when she eats this cake it propels the movie story uh, forward so again <laughs> much easier said than done but this is what we really strive for i think is like if the characters are making choices and the plot is changing because of that that's great those are often the better films i find um and that's really what it comes down to is just plot and character like that really is what it comes down to it's like these are the two the pendulum is swinging back and forth and you know ideally when you're doing the screenings we want the pendulum to swing a little more in the middle so it's equal amounts of both, really. But, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. Some of my favorite movies are just all character and there's not much plot at all happening. You know, I love that. I had friends that we would talk about uh, uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button or uh, Forrest Gump, which is actually the same screenwriter, and he would go bananas because he'd be like, the character's not changing, nothing's happening, it's a horrible movies. But I don't think so. They're great movies, right? So it's just... Depends on what you like. That's the hard part about working with a team is that everyone has likes and dislikes. And with a story team, it's interesting. They're all like little mini directors and they all have their own ideas. 
uh, but that's kind of the fun of it all. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, when you mentioned full pass on on a whole sequence, uh, you mentioned it was good for participate. I'm um, participation. Sorry, procrastination. <laughs> oh, you for thumb. I think thumbnails helped me. Like, oh, I can procrastinate and still get my work done <laughs> by doing that. Yeah. But then right. I found thumbnailing. I think like all the things I talked about, which I can go back to. I love thumbnailing because it, it, it really allowed me to focus on all of these things. I was working rough. I could test out my ideas. I could make sure that like, what's the flow of my shots? Because remember your storyboards are gonna go to an editor and they're gonna edit all these images together. Uh, so they have to work, like they have to make sense. And it took me a while to kind of get that. Uh, I love staging and composition. Like again, these little images that I love just trying to find an interesting image. Like what's an interesting image to look at? and then drawing your way to a solution. So I might not know how I want my sequence to start, but if I'm thumbnailing and thumbnailing, oh, I find something that I think, okay, you know what? I think this, this is how I should start my movie. And then I haven't wasted like two days doing all these big boards. I've wasted maybe two or three hours, right? Not wasted, I've just, I've utilized it in a better way. Uh, but then again, I found also like, oh, I can do a full pass in the sequence and not show up sort of empty handed, which is, that's not what you want when you're working on a feature. They want to see, stuff so they can build upon it and make it better. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Great, okay, yeah. And again, it took me a while to do this. Like I, I came from a 2D animation background, so I was drawing, I was using pencil and drawing these beautiful drawings and then my, the guy I was working with would be like, stop, stop it, like take a pen and learn how to draw with pen and pen is great because you know, everyone has their thing they like to work with, but it, it really loosened me up. And then I learned how to like, oh yeah, this is, it's not about making a pretty drawing, it's about understanding camera and like where the camera goes and staging and composition and acting and all of that stuff. Yeah, cause all I really know how to do is draw big drawings or draw these like bigger sort of things. I don't really know how to do little okay. things like that. All you gotta do is do it. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. You know what I recommend? Um, cause there's some right here uh -huh, is go to the, to the store and get some index cards. These are great. You know why? Because it forces you to draw small and then you can do a bunch of these things and then you can kind of lay them out on a table and you can move them around because that's basically what you're going to do when you're storyboarding, especially if you're going to show them to someone. You can put them on a table, take a picture with your iPhone and go, I think I like this. And then you can move them around, take another picture, like try different versions of, of your images. And like, that's a really fun, that's, that's an often, I have a friends that teach story and that's often what they do with their students. Like you can only tell this, seen in like 20 images. And so it's like forcing you to like, how can I tell as, as much as I can with just one image, right? That's often what you're trying to do. But I love, um, I totally recommend this because they're small and, uh, and just find a nice pen that you like, like to work with. Pencil is fine too, but it's not about making pretty images. It's about making images that make sense and help the story, right? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. And studying, I, the, only, the other thing I would recommend more than anything is studying movie, film. If you want to get into movie making, you kind of have to know your movies. You have to know like why, why do scenes work and why do scenes don't work? So like, again, pick a movie that you like, pick your favorite scene and actually step through, like look at every single shot. That's the wonderful thing about Macs. If you have a DVD player, uh, you, there's a thing, every Mac usually has a thing called VLC and uh, it allows you to grab images. And so you, that's what I did. One of the things I learned, this was a tremendous thing for me. When I worked on finding um, Nemo, I worked on the jellyfish sequence when Dory gets hurt, right? And the father's grabbing Dory and it's like, oh my God, the jellyfish are closing in. How do I get out of here? And he sees a small opening and then he braces to get her out. I really struggled with that. I really had a hard time figuring out camera and where they were going and like keeping track of, of father and Dory and the opening. So I had remembered there was a scene in Independence Day where uh, the two guys end up in the, the alien ship and they drop a bomb and then they have to escape. And there's a door, that same thing. It's like closing and closing. And so I watched that scene and I literally stepped through every shot. Like how many times do they cut to Jeff Goldblum? How many times do they cut to Will Smith? How many times do they cut to the door closing? What is the image like? Are you getting, and sure enough, as I suspected, every time you cut to the door, you're getting closer and closer and closer. And every time you cut to them, you're getting tighter and tighter. And then you cut out wide to see them being chased. Um, that was huge for me. That, that was tremendous. It, it absolutely helped me shift and understand like how I should do that scene. So I cannot recommend enough 
really like looking at movies and then watching movies that you normally wouldn't watch. It's always important, you know, get out of your comfort zone. Um, but again, pay attention to the scenes, like how are they constructed? Because that is what you're going to have to do as a story person. You're going to get anywhere from like a two to a eight page sequence. And it's your job to like visualize the whole thing and give the director a blueprint so they can actually send it to the editor and figure out their film. Yeah, I never really thought about how much you guys had to do. It's like, oh my goodness. Yes. So well, I, I had, when I went to visit Pixar, I saw the storyboards for Toy Story and I was like, yeah, that looks pretty easy. I could draw that, right? Like, but that's like 20% of the job. Like the rest is all this other stuff is like understanding how to visualize script pages, how to understand your shots that are strung together because it's your job to give all that to the editor. And then they're going to give it back to you with all these notes. So you have to be very organized uh at the height of like working on a movie you're often working on three sequences so i'm like thumbnailing one i have one that's like finished being boarding about to be sent to the editor and then i have another one that's in editorial and there's notes coming back to me so like i would be spinning like three plates not all the time but but at times you would be and you realize like oh boy like if i'm not if i'm not organized you can get lost pretty quickly but yeah there's a lot but that's the fun like that's the part it took me about three movies I think until finally when I got to Nemo I think I, I felt like okay now I know like how to do this obviously I was still learning but I wasn't terrified <laughs> of showing stuff and it wasn't until I did my first sequence on Bugs Life and I saw it edited and I realized oh god this thing is horrible <laughs> like I didn't realize what I was doing at all like it, it just took me a while to get there um, there thing I, can rec I can't recommend enough is, man, you guys are so lucky with the DVDs, there's director commentary. It's like film school in a box. Like I cannot recommend that enough. If you like a movie and you can get a handle on a DVD that has director commentary, listen to it because it, they can often be incredibly dense with information and they tell you, you can get really good, like really deep about like why they decided to shoot a scene they did. Oh, this used to be two scenes and we constructed it into one because the story was, you know, there's like, I cannot recommend enough, like what you can get from those. I wish I had those when I was learning. <laughs> um, there are a couple other questions in yes. the chat and you guys, um, I know Nate, you have a couple other things to show, but feel free to throw some questions in there as well. Um, one was, did you work on the canceled movie, Pixar movie, Newt? Which uh, No, I did not, but I had friends that worked on it. I would hear their painful lamentations uh, weekly working on it. Um, but you know what they went through, I went through in other movies. I just, the movies I worked on didn't get shelved. I, you know, for some reason they just got to a point in that movie where they just realized, you know what, this isn't worth doing, which is rare. That's the only time they've ever done that. But I have worked on movies like Coco, for example, I worked on one version of that movie. We pitched it and they were like, what? I don't think we really want to make this. And then their director was like, well, can I try this version? And we did. So like, I, but I did not work on that. No. Um, and then Rose had asked about working in Sharpie. In Sharpie pen? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to work bigger. Like I would often like when I'm working on bigger things or I, I, I don't suggest that for, I guess you could for boarding for like normal size boards. Sure, I had friends that would work in Sharpie. I find it to be too messy for me, um, honestly. My favorite is this. Oh boy, it's old, but this is like, it's called Tombow. a Tombow pen. And it's awesome. It has like a... <laughs> Rose has one too. Yeah. Tombows are great because you can do stuff in, in small and then it has this lovely sort of like large feathery tip. Uh, Tombows were basically like, like everybody worked with these when we had paper. And then we all cried when we had to go digital. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I still do a first pass on paper just because I like it. I don't like to be tethered to the computer. Um, well, I know you had something else you wanted to show. So if there's other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. There's a couple other things in the chat. There's the um, survey, just how you found out about this class that would be awesome. And then Nate also shared with me this article from Animation Magazine about how to land your dream animation job. So yeah, this is actually a great article. It's, it's an interview with a bunch of recruiters from all these different studios and they're giving very specific tips about what they're looking for in your portfolio. So I thought you guys might like that, it's great. Uh, I did want to show a sequence, even though I'm having some issues with Kino. Let's see if we can get this to work. Because I wanted to show you guys an animatic, because that's the, I could talk and talk and talk, but if I wanted to show you guys like what a cut scene looks like with sound effects and, and music and all that stuff. So let's see. Uh, 
this is going to work. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the first version of Finding Dory, the tank gang was in it, and I really wish they could have stayed, but they find, when they're crossing the ocean, father and his son, they find the tank gang stuck in a water bottle. And so why I wanted to show this is because there's boards on paper mixed with digital boards, but also just pay attention to the editing because there's some very quick, fast editing. And then there's also like whip pans that are basically hand drawn. It's just like a bunch of lines on a piece of paper, but it totally works. And you'll see when I play this. So let's see if this is gonna work, hopefully. Okay. So is she a member of your family, Miss Dory? Uh -huh. You know what? She sounds like a keeper. You get us out of here, and we'll help you find her. But how are we going to get out of here? Well, actually, I've been thinking about that, and I have an idea. I've got it. Well, okay, there's always your way. Jock, distance from here to that wall. Uh, it's 20 meters. Bubbles, weight of the container. Uh, 24 tons. Peach, angle of the container. Uh, 74 degrees. Okay, hear me out, Lips. Lips? D did you just call me Lips? Did, did he okay. just call me? There's a strap securing the shelf of water bottles to this container. That's the only thing stopping us from sliding out that door. Now, you see that box of green bottles? You're going to grab the bottle top. We'll hit that ratchet, sliding the rack to the other end of the container. The doors are going to burst open, shearing off every bottle top. The bottles will float up, and we're free. Oh, that's insane. Hey, Lips, rule number one of Tank Club? Never question guilt. Well, I am questioning him. I have several questions, and please stop calling me Dad, late. let's just do it. Gil's not like you. He knows what he's doing. Uh, uh, yes, I'm in. in fact, I think this Gil is a little crazy. Why are they calling me lips? Do I have big lips? Is it that I talk too much? Because I really not want to... <laughs> nice going, lips. Only one bottle left. Thank you. I can see that. Uh, uh, I'd like to say for the record, the odds of this working are extremely low. Ah! fun to work on. So as you saw, the boards are they're edited quite rapidly, but there's like cross dissolves, there's whip pans, there's uh, rack focuses. So we do everything we can to make it look like the real thing, even though they're very rough drawings. Hopefully you enjoy that. Oh, are there any other questions? Oops, sorry. What was that? How many storyboards was that? Oh boy, in that, I would say anywhere from 500 to 1,000, maybe, you know, somewhere in that territory. Oh, oh yeah, it's, and those are the numbered drawings. <laughs> yeah, it gets up into the, like, the tens of, I mean, anywhere from like 80 to 100,000 boards will be in a film. It's nuts, yeah. But it's great. Um. There's some questions in the chat coming in. Thank you guys. And you're also welcome to unmute if you want. But how did you know you wanted to do this job from Matthias? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, I mean, I had been drawing ever since I was a little kid um, and thought I would do comic books. I, I was kind of veering in that direction. Um, I was not, not the best of students, but I, I, I knew if I could find something with drawing that I would be really happy. Uh, and I visited my older brother who went to Cal Arts, And I didn't realize like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you could go to school to study animation. I had no idea. Um, and so I went to school hoping I would learn like a skill set. Uh, 
to ideally do something with that in life. And, and one thing about Cal Arts was just great is that you made a short film every year. And so you learned everything about it. You learned about layout, you learned about animation, storyboarding, uh, character design, all that stuff, right? And so ideally by those end of the two to four years, you had an idea of what maybe you were good at, what you wanted to do. Uh, and uh, I just happened to get lucky when I got out of school and moved to San Francisco. I had a friend working on The Nightmare Before Christmas um, and he needed a, an assistant 2D animator. And so I was psyched. I got that job. And like anything, once you get your foot in the door, it opens up other doors. And so again, I thought I was going to do 2D animation. I didn't really think story was my thing um, until I was looking for more work and Toy Story had come out and they needed people. And I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I wanted to try storyboarding. And so again, I just got very lucky. I got in there and, and sort of apprenticed for like six months um because everything was on paper you which basically cleaned up other people's boards and that that i learned a lot by doing that um, but that's basically how i ended up there yeah um i think there's a question that you, oh there's an echo on me for some reason did you and did your brother enjoy it at cal arts but i'm not sure if you meant did nate enjoy it at cal arts or did his brother both of them went to cal arts so um oh so both of them how is it i really want to go there uh, I think it's probably very different now, but I, can, I mean, it set me up for life because basically the teachers that I met and the classmates that I met, I ended up working with, you know, as I mentioned, my classmate who ended up being a really good friend uh, was working on a film and he needed an assistant. So I was very lucky. Like I just, that's how I got that job. And then my teacher, Joe Ramped, uh, was at Pixar when they were looking to hire more story people. And so the connections that I made there were like worth it alone. Uh, I had a blast there. I'm not going to lie. I was 18 and I was living away from home and it was just like an, this like insane art school where everything went. <laughs> so I absolutely loved it. And, uh, but it, it, I was, I had enough of a mind to know, like, if I learned these skill sets, I could ideally get work. And, uh, and I worked with my older brother on several, we worked on Finding Nemo, Finding Dory, Wally, -E, Bugs Life. We worked on several movies together. We worked very well together. Yeah. Um, do you have any other questions about Cal? Um, no, not right now because I don't know if it changed or not. Because it's been a well, I think it's, a, I think it's still a great place to go, and, it, and you again, like me, I think you're going to make great connections. I mean, I I loved it there, but th there are so many other options. And this was back in 1988 when I went to school, and it was either that. Rhode Island School of Design or Sheridan. Like those are the only three major schools that did animation. I think it's an entirely different ball game now. I, I, I mean, I think. Oh. Um, so Rose wanted to know how strong your draftsmanship needs to be to work at a studio like this. I think it needs to be pretty strong. Pretty strong. Um, um, story, story is interesting, story is interesting because, because we want to see how you think. That's why thumbnails, are, I think, are great because you can really tell if someone understands the, the cinema language. And by that, I mean, like, do they know where to put the camera? Do they know about editing? Do they know about, is their staging and composition strong? Um, is their acting good? So yeah, it, but you don't have to be amazing. I worked with a lot of story guys that had a very cartoonish sensibility, but it worked fine. Um, every director wants something a little different, uh, but you got to be able to draw and draw fast. Like that's, that's one of the things. So, so life drawing really helped me with that. And then of course, just like drawing every day on the job, it was quite helpful. But yeah, the, you, you have to be pretty proficient, you know, especially now with digital, it's like, you got to know how to work in either Toon Boom or Photoshop or what, what there's so many other ways to do it, I think. Um, were you in A113? I'm sorry, what was that? Were you in the classroom A113? Yes, I had my layout class in there, yeah. Yeah, I totally had a class in that room. It was, it's, it's weird to see it like pop up in different movies. Yeah. Um, Miranda asked, do you put yourself on time limits for each drawing? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, well, it's not so much if, if I catch myself. Yeah, that's again why I, when you're in, when you're boarding, you can easily, especially with Photoshop, like you get caught up in the bells and whistles. So yeah, I catch myself all the time and you got to just keep moving. Um, I, I like to work in shots. So I like organize all my storyboards into shots. So if I know like, okay, I'm working on a sequence that's going to have like 60 shots. I got to make sure that I rough out each of those shots before I start noodling with other stuff. That's how I do it. It's like, I got to make, I, 
Uh, I just did a job for a live action film, which I loved. It was like same thing, storyboarding, but for a live action sensibility. And so it was very helpful. Like I got to make sure I rough out all of the shots before I get in there and do anything else and start posing things out or, or, or getting noodly with lighting. Like that's what I do. I sort of just, it helps me keep moving and not forgetting like, oh, right. I have 10 other shots that I have to do. Do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between boarding for live action versus animation? And you even did some story work on a documentary recently. Like yeah, yeah. Happened. The story work for the documentary was just like literally, it was just story, um, story structure. It was like sitting in a room with the directors talking about the cut of the movie they had. I love that because it was just, it was a story structure talk and character stuff. Live action is interesting. I just, again, just boarded on a movie for Michael Arndt, who was the script writer for Toy Story 3, and he's making his own live action movies. And he loves the, the, the real process. He loves storyboarding the whole movie, editing it, and then showing it. It's almost like having test screenings before you even shoot any footage. Uh, and so I love that. It was the same sensibilities, but he actually wanted to do, he wants to shoot much of the movie like a handheld. So it was really tricky to like manufacture sort of like handheld shots. And there, that means you have very long shots with not much cuts. So that, that was interesting to get used to that sensibility. I did work on another project where they're not gonna make an animatic, they're just gonna basically take the storyboards, print them on a piece of paper, like four to a page, and put them in a binder. And then the director would sit with the, the DP and the camera person and go, okay, this is how we're gonna, this is the shot we're gonna do today. And so it's a way for them to, again, like keep all the shots organized. I actually really like that because it was less, less posing, less, less acting. It was more just like, where's the camera gonna be? And like a few poses and just make sure we know what the cuts are gonna be. That, I like that a lot. With the live action where you were manufacturing the camera shots, did you do that in Photoshop or did you just have to like draw it all out? Yeah, no, well, I didn't, it, I, I would rough it out on paper and I would pitch it to the director and then, and then I would do the final images on Photoshop, yeah. And again, I knew like with that kind of stuff where they have it in a binder, they might not use it at all, or, but they might end up using it 100%. Like they know exactly where they want the camera to be and it's, it's very helpful, it's like a blueprint. And that, like the Coen brothers are a great film. Like I love their films and they storyboard everything. They like to be prepared. It doesn't mean they're going to use everything, but they storyboard all of their movies. Um, so Rose was wondering, this goes back to the conversation about connections. How do you make connections with bigger studios if you're not at a bigger name school like CalArt, Sheridan, Ringling, et cetera? I think that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I can tell you uh, LinkedIn is a great, you know, use for like get your profile on LinkedIn and then there's so many online things like Animation Collaborative which is a bunch of guys that set this online school up like literally across the street from Pixar. Um, there's so many things like that I think you can get access to and those guys I think there's just so much network to, networking to be done in that regard. There's like internships that you can do at these studios. That's how often we would hire is we would have like an internship in the summer and that would be anywhere from like six to eight people usually students and then they would often hire one of them, one or two of them sometimes. It was a great way to, again, like literally a boot camp to like figure out, okay, can these guys do it? Are they gonna learn? Can they take direction? Are they, uh, can they do fixes and write? Like, can they manage their time? And um, that's, I think that's just like a, some of the things that I can think of about like trying to stay connected. Yeah, I would add also just as some, this is something that Real Stories does a lot. There are a lot of great just sort of online networks, women in animation, yeah. women in film. The women in film in the Bay Area is not as active as like the LA women in film, but I think there's always opportunities to really, you know, be in room with other filmmakers and find out, you know, who's working and who, what, I mean, especially right now with the industry being sort of really hampered by COVID, the only thing that is working is animation. So animation. there's a lot of work to be had, um, yeah. you know, and, I think to Nate's point about being a great drafts person, I think that's really important. But, you know, I was the story manager at Pixar and the arts department manager. It's also, can you do work well with others? Um, yes. I think that's like a really big piece of it. And because it's a very collaborative activity. Yeah, because it, it, and she makes a great point. I've, I saw some guys come in on the movie and I'd be like, oh man, I'm, it's time to pack up. Like, I, there's no way I can compete with this because they were such good draftsmen, but they didn't take direction and they didn't work well in a room. And those are the people that didn't last long. It's very yeah. tricky. There's also a CIFA. A CIFA is a great organization. If you become a member, it's not that expensive. They have a lot of networking in that organization. It's really good. Well, and even with like a CIFA and some of those, they have student memberships or if you just yeah. ask them 
you know, just say I need a scholarship, they will certainly, you know, and then Rose being on the East Coast, there's a lot of, you know, feel free to email us. There's a lot of different, we work with a lot of folks in New York and on the East Coast as well. So we're happy to connect you with some folks on the, there as well. Um, are there other questions? I, I'm sure we can uh, add some more in there. Uh, um, Alexandria, do you want to just, Ali, do you want to just unmute? Because that's a lot of words. I can't read yeah, them. Yeah, that was a lot of words in the chat, but everyone was, there's, a, I didn't want to interrupt the, the flow of the combo. But, um, you know, uh, I haven't worked specifically in film, and but I've worked for 10 years as a journalist and also been working with real stories where we've, you know, we're a small but mighty team and we've gotten some incredible filmmakers to come and actually lead classes for us and such. And literally how I've done that when we when we maybe don't have the right connections to these people or they're newer filmmakers that have made a big splash and we want to team up with them or we want to just have a chat with them. It sounds wild, but like cold emailing and messaging and being very genuine in your messages and explaining exactly like why you are excited about their work or would want to learn more about that work. Surprisingly, I would say even more than 50% of the time I get responses and I'm not somebody that has any name weight in the filmmaking world. So, I mean, you all sound like a lot of you here are already doing some really awesome creations and have that ambition. So you would even have more of a chance to get those responses. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Like it may seem overly simple, but I saw Nate, your head was nodding. It does work. <laughs> Yeah, I actually met some, one of my favorite filmmakers. I, I, I love horror movies and I saw this insane trailer and I found his website and I emailed him and I was shocked. He like wrote back, we traded emails and I actually got him to come to Pixar and show the movie. It was just like, man, I'm so glad I sent that email. Like you just never, you never know. Yeah, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So you might as well right. take some of them. And especially I think if you're, you know, you don't necessarily look like what people think a filmmaker looks like. It can feel really intimidating. So, you know, I think it's really important to um, to get out of that comfort zone and send those emails. Um, what was your favorite animated movie as a child? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I grew up, uh, you know, it was basically Disney or Blue through the automation with the three people that would, I, I mean, as a kid, I loved Alice in Wonderland, which I'm not surprised by because I love weird, stuff and like I just as a kid I marveled at the, the weirdness of that movie that was my favorite like Disney um the, the thing that actually got me really focused and like really wanting to do animation was Vincent I don't know about has anybody seen it's a black and white 1982 Tim Burton short that Rick he and Rick Heinrichs made and I it blew my mind I had never seen it and I, I didn't quite like it uh, I seek it out it's actually on the Nightmare Before Christmas DVD so for me, like the first job I got that was literally connected to that was like insane. I couldn't believe the luck of, of working on a film by the same director. That would be my favorite like short, I think. But like Disney movie, yeah, I, I, I loved Alice in Wonderland. It was like one of my personal favorites. But I like, I like all sorts of random things that I grew up seeing. Um, ben wanted to know what the horror movie was yeah. with the director. <laughs> Frankenstein's Army. It is amazing. Yeah. If, if you have the stomach for like amazing practical effects and a lot of gore. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh man. I cannot recommend it enough. <laughs> My wife's like, no. Yeah. It's Probably awesome. Probably don't watch that. <laughs> um, and then Miranda, were you asking what his favorite live action movie was? Do you oh, a, yeah. Do As my wife knows, that's like a rabbit hole. It's it's impossible to pick we'll one. For like three hours. Uh, yeah. I, oh boy. But you know, I I there's so many. I mean, we did we did like a, a Desert Island Five. I think kind of the, where you like what are the five movies you could bring? And you know, I think um, Shawshank Redemption is one of my favorites. Um, Apocalypse Now uh, is easily one of my favorites. Um, Blade Runner. These are all, you know, I was, I'm a child of the 80s, so there's all these 80s films that just, like, really resonated with me. Um, Time Bandits, uh, wow. Like, if you have not seen that movie, I saw that when I was 11, and I thought my, my head exploded. I had never, it, 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 you just have to see it. It's got everything in it, and I have never seen something so bizarre and dark 
and funny. Yeah, that's easily one of my favorites. Um, Godfather, you know, is like classic. Lawrence of Arabia is one of my favorites. Um, I love horror. So yeah, things like Frankenstein's Army is, is, is pretty fantastic. Um, the Witch is a recent horror movie that I, I absolutely loved. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a bit of a rabbit hole for me. Like I could go on and on. Like I love foreign films. So I, you know, there's, there's a whole, that's a whole world of cinema that is like so different than American cinema. Yeah. Uh, oh, so the animated uh, Rock and Rule. It's like this super weird, crazy Canadian 1983 with Iggy Pop as the voice of the main character. Oh, it's bizarre. But if you can find it, it's great. Yeah. Um, I hope that Brandon answers. Brandon to know if you've seen Beetlejuice. Uh, are you kidding? Yes, I I loved Beetlejuice. Yes, massive crush on that. when I saw that movie. I was like, I want her to be my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Beetlejuice. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, like that sensibility of Tim Burton. Absolutely. Yeah, super fun. Yeah, I, I was 16 when that came out. I was like, loved it. Yeah. Um, all right, we've got just a few minutes left. Are there other questions that we can answer about the storyboarding process around story films that you know, ideas that you have that you need help getting started? Wanting to was it hard to make cars too? Oh my gosh, yes, because I, I had never been the head of story, which is why I took the job. Um, a because I really wanted to learn how to do it. B I didn't work on the first cars movie, so I was like, yeah, it's all new. Um, like we lost a year of production, like right when I started. And so I was like, oh man, if I had known that was going to happen, I never would have taken the job. Uh, that was really tricky. I, I was, I had an interview with the guys on Nightmare on a, there's a great podcast called We Know Jack Show. You should check out. Anyways, we, we talked about like why that movie worked. And I, I think it was just like, it was this amazing set of ingredients. By that, I mean the right people at the right place. I think for Cars 2, it was almost the opposite. It was like the wrong group of people at the wrong place. And it just, it was a, very very difficult movie uh because we just it took us forever to find it i was new at the job the writer was new the director was new the producer was new it just it was it was just a a bad set of ingredients in terms of like you can't, you can't have that many new people that don't really have that much experience uh trying to do it it wasn't all bad like i loved learning how to be ahead of story and, and dealing with the crew but it was really it, that was really difficult yes um but then john came out at the very end and sort of like got everything pulled together and that was also an exciting experience too. Um, how has COVID changed the way you and others in your industry are doing their jobs? Not sure. um, well, for me, it's kind of insane. I'm, I'm a head of story on a feature based in Cape Town, South Africa. And so like, I'm doing it from here and like all of my team is spread out everywhere. I've got a guy in Israel, I've got a guy in Wales, I've got two guys in California. Some of them are in Cape Town. They're not um, all guys. One, yes, sorry, uh, by that I mean just people. There's uh, somebody in Spain. So it's like, it's all being done remotely and it's not, I don't love that, but they're making it work. And like somehow we just were able to review sequences. And like I had mentioned, I do my notes on paper. If I want to do some hand-drawn notes, I'll scan it in and then send them over the email. So like working remotely, it's not ideal, but I don't think I would have done this job otherwise. Like it just happened to sort of fall into place. And I love working with these guys. Yeah, I just, I wish we were all together. So working remotely is basically how it's how it's changed everything. But like Esther was saying, there's tons of animation now because that's the one thing you can do. You can do it from afar. More of a technical kind of question. Yes. So like, it's like say you're doing an action shot and you want to do something where the camera like the camera orbits like I know you can move camera z axis when you like with truck outs and stuff yeah I know that there are always those really cool shots where the camera is almost like moving on one of those orbit <clears throat> kind of things yeah you mean where you're like rotating around a character is that what you're asking yeah kind of like the scene with Elastigirl in the second Incredibles movie when she's standing up in the city okay yeah are you asking how do you do that on the boards or like, how do you how do you execute that kind of stuff? You have to hand draw it. That's like the tr I I, ugh, I don't I do not like doing hand drawn camera moves, but you kind of have to. Um, so it's just labor intensive. You just have, that's where like learning like knowing how to draft, be a good drafts person, is really handy because you're like rotating a camera around. A lot of what they'll use is After Effects. After Effects is a great program where you can do all your poses and backgrounds and whatever, and then like 
we would basically give them to an After Effects person and then they would execute that camera move. So I know for Brad Bird, he used a lot of After Effects in his reels. Um, Cause he didn't want to have to figure out the movie once he got into layout. Like he wanted to know exactly what the camera was doing, but it's very labor and time intensive just to do it. I don't know if that answers your, your question, but. So you hand, so to quickly clarify that like you hand draw the backgrounds as well as the characters both yes. turning. Yeah. That's why After Effects is nice is you can just give one background and like they're moving the camera around, like making it look sort of three dimensional. Um, but again, that's why it's so labor intensive. Like I, I don't, I never liked, I can do a whip pan or I could do a pan or even a, a camera rotate, but um, it's, it, you have to draw everything. So you have to draw, know how to draw perspective and learn how things are moving. And yeah, it just takes forever. Yeah. Is that when oh, you were working on the live theater piece with? Um... Oh, with Coppola? Yeah, no, that was just basically, that was just giving him interesting staging and composition, interesting shots. So that was weird because they were going to shoot it live. I couldn't do over the shoulders because you would see the other camera. So I had to be like very <laughs> judicious about like where the shots were and how they would look. No, more for like Coco, like, you know, Lee really liked moving the camera around and actually for the live action film, because I was doing like almost like these handheld shots. It was very labor intense. I would have to move, like shift the, move, the camera so the background would have to shift. And I mean, you try to do it as rough as you can, uh, but it's got to read. Um, so we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, there's one in the chat. So if anybody also wants to throw their question in or just let us know if you have a question, but do you still enjoy the new way of am an animating? animating? <laughs> Were you ever not sure about continuing after everything moved to digital? Uh, I mean, for me that happened when I was storyboarding. So I just had to learn how to use a Cintiq. So, I mean, I, I, I get, I like it. I mean, it's, I mean, especially now, cause you have to, there's no other way I could do the job from afar. Um, but I miss, I, 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 it, nothing replicates this. If you guys can still see the screen, um, you know, pinning everything up and then pitching and then like having a group of people coming up with ideas and sketching them. And like, you can't replicate that. And I, I, I miss it. Um, but I like doing both. I think both are, are fine. Yeah. The hard part is just not getting lost in the tools like Photoshop. There's so many bells and whistles and tools that you can get lost in. Um, but are they really going to help you? Like, are they really going to help with the scene? Are they going to help with uh, create the, a better story? Probably not, uh, unless you really know exactly what your story is. But by that, I mean, like, it's good to stay rough and just, and, and you, cause you're constantly shifting the story. Um, but it depends on what the director wants. Sometimes the director wants really refined, like nice boards. So digital is great because you only have to draw one background and that's it. And then you move everything else around. Um, great. And then Ben, you had a question. Do you want to just unmute? Oh uh, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Um, I have a question. Is, is plane still part of the cars canon or is it being phased out of the animated talking vehicle cinematic universe? Because they never quite acknowledged each other. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think the people that worked on those movies, were, you know, John was sort of overseeing everything at that point. So I, I think, yeah, I, I remember him talking about it. He always felt that planes and cars were sort of living in the same universe. I can only imagine that at some point there was probably going to be some sort of crossover. Um, but now that John is not there, I don't think, I don't think they're so, I don't think cars is like super high <laughs> on the totem pole of things that they want to do. I mean, now that they're streaming, um, there may be more. I always thought Mater's Tall Tales were a great thing. Like those little shorts were marvelous. And it's, it's a great way to kind of like make more of those. Uh, I am not at Pixar anymore. So I really, I have no idea, <laughs> honestly. Oh. Great. So if you guys have any last questions, just let me know by putting me in the chat or you can raise your hand. Otherwise, um, just as a couple reminders that it would be super helpful if you guys could just fill out this quick little survey about how you found out about it. Um, it would mean the world to us. And then if you're really interested in story and screenwriting, I would highly recommend, we do think this will sell out this three week um, masterclass with Christy mm. Lowry, who's a television writer um, and has wrote for Lone Star 911, 12 Monkeys and Absentia. She's really great. It's gonna be a fantastic way to dive a little bit more deeply into the screenwriting process, which goes hand in hand with what Nate was talking about, um, plot and character. Yes. And also just to kind of find out more about the difference between episodic writing 
um, and um, feature film writing. I mean, one of the things Christy did a one day, a one hour workshop for us this summer and just in the world of television, the writer is the like top person and then the director works for the writer, which is very different than in feature film where the director is sort of the head dictator, if you will. So, um, is she, is she basically a showrunner? Is that what her role is? In the, she's not the showrunner, okay. but she's the show writer mm. um, for uh, 911 Lone Star. Mm. So um, I don't know who the showrunner is for that. I think it's like Rob Lowe or something. Um, but she works with Jennifer Lynch, who directs mm. for that. So, um, but thank you guys so much for coming. Um, you know, Real Stories is a super small nonprofit uh, based here in the Bay Area. All of our programs for youth are sliding scale tuition. So. By purchasing a ticket tonight, you help make sure that we can always keep our programs um, that way, that anyone can afford, uh, that anyone can attend. And even better yet, all of your tickets were doubled because Quest Foundation um, is matching all of these events right now. So we're really excited. So thank you so much for supporting us and supporting the work here. If you have more questions for Nate, um, you can email me at esther at real-stories.com. I live with him so I can track him down and make sure yes. they get no answered yeah. um, around, especially specific questions for those of you who are considering a career in this, um, how to get started. I think that article is really great. I took a look at it as well. Um, I think those are just really important ways to figure out how you can kind of get your dream job. So if yeah. unless there's anything else, I just want to thank you all for attending. This was really awesome. Yeah, thanks. And I saw, sorry for the technical difficulties, but hopefully you saw and heard everything okay. We've all had technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. And thank you guys all for who joined in on the questions. It makes it so much better if we're not just all like. <laughs>